Welcome to the part two of the International Christian University Linguistic Colloquium, as known as ICU Link, that's organized with the uh, uh, with various areas of linguistics. And uh, in April, uh, we are having four semantics talks. I'm Sung Hun Lee from ICU, and today we have two exciting talks by Satoshi Tomioka uh, from University of Delaware and Hiroaki Saito from Yale University and University of Connecticut. Let me introduce the first speaker, uh, Satoshi Tomioka, a professor of linguistics at University of Delaware. He's received his PhD from University of Massachusetts Amherst and uh, worked on areas uh, such as semantics, pragmatics, prosody and intonation, as well as syntax. Uh, his recent papers uh, analyze, for example, focus without reflex and pitch in Japanese my questions and also uh, uh, intervention effects in other languages. Uh, he works on Japanese, but also on Korean and Mandarin Chinese, uh, and his work appeared in various journals, such as Journal of East Asian Linguistics, Theoretical Linguistics, Natural Language and Linguistics Theory, among others. Satoshi graduated from ICU in uh, some time ago, and it is good to have you back today. <laughs> I'm not going to say that <laughs> necessarily. <laughs> so thank, uh, thank you for being here, Satoshi. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for um, uh, inviting me. It would be great to be there physically. Of course, this, this way I can reach out to the people I would not see otherwise. So this would be really a good alternative. So let me just share my screen. Today, I'm... Um, uh, hold on a second. Oh, it's not being shared yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oops. <laughs> um, today, I think um, I, I was introduced that this is a, the uh, semantic series, but uh, primarily it's syntax today. Sorry if I dis if I disappoint some of you. Um, uh, it's it's been a while, you know, um, that I give a primarily the syntax talk, but uh, this is about um, structure called right dislocation. Excuse me. Let me just put this one to the. So, so this is the, uh, the kind of structure that is often described as right dislocation in Western languages, the French, German, and Dutch typically happens is that you have um, something like critic or weak pronoun in the main clause and, and something that corresponds to that pronoun to the right um, of the sentence, right side of the sentence. So this is French. So you have lui, which is the dative um, uh, pronoun, critic. And also you have den, which is um, in the first position on the V2 scheme, and then you have den pay it up, so on and so forth. This is accusative. Oops, excuse me. Uh, today's focus is primary on Japanese and Turkish, the right dislocation structure in head final languages, two of those languages. and. Compared to the movement to the left, this type of you know, dislocation structure, whether it's movement or not, um, did not get as much attention, but has gotten a fair amount nonetheless. And uh, Japanese, and of course, um, uh, Kuno sensei already talked about uh, the, the sentence um, in, in his uh, Dama no Bumpo 1978 book, and also Murat Kral discussed this type of structure in Turkish in 1997. Okay, so the idea is that we have a canonical structure, and then you have this um, dislocated phrase, in this case, both, both uh, cases object or object-like thing. After the verb, this is typically, you know, it's not typical, right? So it's atypical structure where, you know, uh, typically uh, the verb is the very final um, uh, element in the sentence, but here you have something other than the verb. So before doing that, I, I like to kind of do the disclaimer. Number one is that our story today is only really about gapped um, uh, right dislocations where there is a silent element in the, in the corresponding position um, to the, uh, the dislocated element. So for instance, you can actually have a repeated um, right dislocation such as um, a 6A, or some sort of anaphoric expression, something pretty much close to, let's say, um, uh, Western languages, um, uh, such as Dutch and, and, and French, where pronoun-like element is in the main clause, okay? That's also possible in, in, in Turkish. 
as well as in Japanese. We are not going to talk about this. Um, many analysis of right dislocation gapped kind um, includes gap less kind as the uh, within the domain of explanation but we we have a good reason to think that this may not be a good idea okay and we follow um kohi john's um uh, 20 um 2016 paper uh, on this uh, decision and we also follow hejun's paper that probably we are not going to talk about um non-argument right dislocations such as um uh, prepositional phrase or postpositional phrase such as from America and 8A, or um, adverbial, such as certainly in 8B. We are not 100% committed to Hijun's idea that these two, uh, the argument versus adjunct, are the real um, uh, different kinds of right dislocation, but we just like to focus on something that we are a little bit more confident about, which is the argument right dislocation with the gap, with the silent element in corresponding main clause on the left. So today's presentation will focus on the following three characteristics or following points, which are not, in our opinion, but not always central to the existing analysis. Okay. So it is strictly main clause phenomenon that we just embedding, except the strictly direct quote. Okay. It is totally optional in the following sense. Okay. It doesn't mean that there is no pragmatic condition imposed on it. It's just like whenever right dislocation sentence is felicitous, the canonical counterpart is also felicitous. So do you have any kind of environment where right dislocation sentence is felicitous, but canonical counterpart is not felicitous? Well, we don't find such an environment. So in this sense, it is strict, it is totally optional. And number three, it is it is found almost exclusively in speech not in written text. This might be an interesting point um, uh, if you think about scrambling to be something like an optional operation. Uh, but scrambling, for instance, may be you know, optional and semantically vacuous and all that bit, um, but you can actually find uh, non-canonical word order as a result of scrambling in written text as well. So something about this right dislocation makes um, if if you find right dislocation in written text, which mean that that text has a speech style, so it means that the writing itself is mimicking something like speech. Okay, so it's kind of striking element uh, uh, um, in this particular construction. So um, main clause phenomena uh, part of the, the the construction has been discussed, not satisfactorily in our opinion in humble opinion so we'd like to raise that issue today two is sometimes acknowledged but not analyzed and number three is rarely mentioned um partly because it's not something that typical theoretical syntax uh, researchers care much about okay on the other hand the frequently discussed syntactic properties of right dislocation such as scope reconstruction island sensitivity binding connectivity polarity licensing a case connectivity all the sexy stuff we are not going to talk about today <laughs> so uh not that we haven't thought about those i think um Dusan's paper actually has discussion on many of those uh issues it's just like we like to focus on the thing that um uh, that make our perspective a little bit different from the other people's. So before going into the, um, the actual analysis that we are going to present, um, there's, a there is a particular kind of ana analysis of red dislocation that is you know, growing in popularity. That is biclosal plus silent elements such as ellipsis or silent predicate analysis. So there's a long list of people. Again, Kuno Sensei was really like very, um, how to say, uh, it's like a fortune teller, right? So he can actually anticipate that the kind of analysis that people would really appreciate later. So, so this analysis not only comes from Japanese, uh, but also um, from Korean uh, studies and as well as um, uh, let's say Germanic, such as Autumn de Free, recent paper. So general idea is this, right dislocation involves two sentences. Okay, the first sentence in the gap case, we have something like 
Simon pronoun or argument ellipsis or whatever the ellipsis that is relevant. And the second sentence, right dislocated element is a leftover of ellipsis or silent structure. So this is the general scheme of things. And analysis, analysis differ in, a, in, in kind of following points, whether silent element is pro, small pro, or argument ellipsis. The movement of the um, right dislocation is a scrambling or fragment movement, or silent structure in the second clause is ellipsis deletion, or silent pro predicate. People have different opinions um, on those issues, but general scheme of thing is this. You have two sentences, some sort of silent structure involved. Okay. Kohi John has a paper and a very potent critique of um, this by closer analysis based on Korean data. And, and, and she goes through many kinds of um, by closer analysis and finds out, you know, finds the problematic aspects of the analysis and in and, 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 and many of the analysis. Our critique today is more general not specific to this, this, his analysis and her analysis, it's applicable to all kinds of bi-structure or bi close analysis, because we find this to be a little bit less than convincing. So we're, gonna, we're not gonna be fashionable today because the, the fashionable analysis is the bi closer. We are just going against being fashionable today. So first of all, it's a very strange ellipsis. So that's the fun thing, okay. so. Usually, the following generalization about ellipsis holds, okay, based on Ruth's focus-based condition on ellipsis and the redundancy. So, if you, I don't, I don't want to go through today because it's not, it's not. I don't want to spend too much time on semantic um, aspect of uh, focus theory, but it goes something like: when a syntactic constituent alpha is elided, there is a syntactic constituent beta that is. Uh, such that it properly contains alpha in a, in a sense that beta is a bigger structure that contains alpha in it, as well as another constituent gamma, which is focused. So in other words, you have, you have ellipsis, then you have to find a larger structure that contains the elided phrase. On top of that, you have to find a constituent that is focused. That is a generalization. Why does the generalization hold? That's because of the root focus condition on on ellipsis and redundancy. Okay, so for instance, if you if the question is, did Chris send flowers to Andy? And it's odd to say yes, flowers. Okay, it's not the case that you cannot say flowers as long as you focus and the focus is somehow justified. Yeah, flowers of all things, but we all know that Andy is not the romantic type. So it's like, yeah, flowers, can you believe it? Type of accent is okay. And of course you can contradict and it's a no, chocolate. So here we have this, supposedly we have this ellipsis structure that flowers Chris sent to Andy or chocolate Chris sent to Andy. That ellipsis is licensed when you have a focus, right? But if you try to do that with the right dislocation, it, the the effect is the opposite. You should not have focus on the right dislocation case. So that is, that is true for both um, uh, Japanese and, um, sorry, the Turkish. Korean is a little bit tricky. That's why we are, not, we are not talking about Korean today, Korean fact today. So the fact is, when you have a right dislocation, it's actually better not to have focal prominence. And things are a little bit more complicated. It doesn't have to be always given or presupposed, but it's 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 certainly not focal accent, the focal prominence uh, that is found in that dislocated element, which is what you should expect if it's ellipsis. Another thing about ellipsis is that, with the only exception that I'm aware of, um, of um, comparative deletion, ellipsis is optional. And the ellipsis always had this counterpart, phonologically overt counterpart, usually reduced prosodically. The ellipsis and its phonologically reduced overt counterpart have more or less the same discourse functions so that the same discourse environment licenses both and without really changing the meaning, right? So that's the whole point of ellipsis versus repeated. Um, structure. So Bukuri says everybody, Anna did, or Anna Kuri says everybody, this is the BP ellipsis case, as opposed to repeated BP. 14 is sluicing, 
uh, WH stranding and then you have IP deleted or not deleted but repeated. Um, both are fine and one may sound a little bit wordy and long-winded, but both are licensed, provided that repeated part gets reduced prosodically. Okay, well, is that also true for right dislocation? So it goes like this, like a John Gayondayo LGBO. Would that be the same thing? John Gayondayo LGBO John Gayondayo? Or I cannot pronounce a Turkish, but Turkish should be uh, basically 16. So the idea is that I don't think we feel that way. We feel that A examples in 15 and 16 involve either two speech acts being performed or one speech act is kind of repeated somehow for the, for the reason of the emphasis, for the reason of making it clearer. There's something about two things going on, not one. But when you say LGBO, I think we have the strong kind of intuition that it is actually the one sentence of one speech act. And it also shows up in prosody as well. So when you have an interrogative sentence that has um, uh, right dislocation, typically what happens is that um, the verb ending gets a typical interrogative uh, intonation. Okay. If you try to do that both right, uh, raising, it's just infelicitous. Okay, when you repeat, okay, you, I mean, repeating two questions, of course, it's the idea is that, is that the same thing as the 17, but that, let's shelve that question aside. And then try to read the two questions being repeated. I think the natural prosody is both sentences get rising intonation. Okay, so then the prediction would be that you actually elide the John Mayumi Mashtaka a second time, then that rising uh, intonation should attach to the remaining Hongo, right dislocation, which is 17b, the unattested ungrammatical um, uh, structure. On the other hand, supposedly bad one, 18, 18a, where the first question is rising intonation, the second uh, intonation, second sentence has a uh, uh, falling intonation, that would be. The, the if that would be uh, the input, 70A would be derived, but 18A is not a good input. The ungrammatical rising rising is the, the correct and right uh, intonation when two questions are juxtaposed. Okay, so for instance, vaccine to vaccine to share, okay, no, doko de okay, no, or doko de vaccine to share, okay, no, so there are two questions. So the first one, like I want a confirmation question, oh, did you really? get the, first, um, the vaccine shot. Where did you get that? Okay, so here you, you actually feel that the two questions are asked. Then if you elide, okay, uh, the second, second predicate, then you have two rising intonations. This is right. Yeah, but that's not what it means, that the right dislocation. Then suppose that we find a way to regard two juxtaposed interrogative sentences represent just one question act for some reason, for strange reason we did regard that. Then the expected prosody is 20A, where the first question, okay, doesn't count as a question. Then if you believe that the uh, rising intonation is associated with the question, then only the sentence final, um, the second question, the second interrogative sentence to get the rising intonation, then you should have something like something like this. This is again, completely unacceptable. I just wanna make sure that it's actually not the case that noun phrase like hongo or kurumao cannot get the rising intonation. It's actually perfectly fine. This is the kind of fragment question where something Question sentence was elided, right? So, Ken uh, was BMW no shinsha o kattan datte, so na takai kuruma o, that kuruma o get the rising intonation, meaning that so na takai kuruma o katta no, katta no is elided, and of course, rising intonation moved to the noun phrase. So, that should not, so that should be perfectly fine, right? So, then um, why should, don't we have, you know, it's just like we don't have expected um, prosodic pattern. 
So what we like to do is to drive 23. Rising at the at the uh, um, uh, the, uh, the verb plus question marker and falling and rising. Uh, sorry, the uh, right dislocation. But we seem to be out of options to account for the attested prosodic pattern. So that's the those are the kind of reason we, we think that it's actually probably not a good idea to use um, uh, by close analysis. So our proposal was inspired by Hijan. This is the Hijan festival today. Um, the Hijan's ideas uh, we, we borrow, she had this leftward movement plus remnant movement idea. So the idea is that the first you move a phrase that will end up being the right of the sentence, um, uh, right edge of the sentence. That's because you move the, um, um, uh, the right dislocating phrase first to the left and the remaining the remainder of the entire center clause moved to the left further. This is what's called remnant movement. So when you have a um, Korean, like a Cherry uh, uh, nominative yesterday met Yangi accusative, and the Yangi accusative comes at the end, but it that's the first one moved to the left, and the remaining sentence moved to the to the uh, to uh, moves past the uh, Yangi and attached to what we call topic phrase. Okay, so the first one is that but, uh, she considered the first movement to be a focus movement and the second movement is, um, is a movement uh, to topic phrase, so to speak. And there are a few reasons why we do not adopt uh, as the core's idea for Japanese and Turkish as a whole package, because the information structure partition is wrong. So we, we already saw that right dislocation doesn't get a focal prominence, so it's really not focus. Shimojo's dissertation, um, there's an interesting case where right dislocation is kind of, that's correspond to new information, that, ah, yeah, that new iPad is, is a new information. You can actually start the conversation like this. Well, guess what I, what I did last yesterday? That's fine. Okay. What he observed is that um, new information focus is fine, but narrow focus, such as you know, truly focal, contrastive focus, or WH phrase is not allowed. Okay, so something something not quite right about this focus movement idea. And also, it doesn't really tell us much about right dislocation as a main clause phenomena. Um, for instance, you might think that, well, okay, because it's a topic phrase, topic phrase doesn't really like to embed, maybe being the topic phrase account for the, um, uh, the unembeddable nature of right dislocation, but that is actually not true. Topic phrase, topic phrase can embed under certain circumstances and uh, things like um, uh, attitude verb with to and koto both. I think we, we're gonna hear more, more about to today and saito and stop today later. And also because clause. So those are the ones that, that tolerate uh, topic marking, wa marking and nun marking in, in Korean and, and Japanese, but red dislocation structure is not allowed. And also the size of the remnant moved clause really cannot be an IP, according, you know, in our opinion. First of all, you can have an interrogative marker like ka, which is, you know, you might want to call it, this is the C head. But also the variety of discourse particles such as yo and ne and na or teba or um, any, any kind of discourse particle that comes at the end, that can move along. You know, if you think about this remnant movement is right. So for instance, um, atta yo ne, that yo and ne are both stacked up and then you can actually do the, the, to the dislocation as well. All right, so it's got to be bigger than what we uh, what we think is as typical as an IP. Oops. Okay, so uh, Turkish also has something something like a discourse particle. Is uh, işte is the one işte can come at the beginning or at the end of the uh, the sentence when they when it functions as a discourse particle, and right dislocation can come after işte. And also, Turkish also has an interesting um, uh, expression that counts as a tag question, and right dislocation can come after the uh, tag question. It can come before tag question, but it can come after tag question as well. 
So therefore, the remnant moves to the left must be a phrase much larger, larger than IP. All right, so our proposal is this. The target of remnant movement is what we call discourse phrase, the highest projection that syntax generates. A similar idea has been pursued by different people. For instance, Beninka, I think this is the well-known paper. She proposed a discourse phrase as a location that hosts at what we call hanging topic. The topic doesn't, it doesn't involve critical dislocation. I can't remember exactly what the definition of the topic. It's like even looser notion of topic than typical critic list dislocation type topic. Also, Cecil Descartes, um, uh, natural language and linguistics um, theory paper, use a discourse projection at the site where critic left dislocation or critic right dislocation phrase is attached with that movement. So the things like discourse phrase, the discourse projection has been proposed. So we like to call this, this discourse, um, discourse phrase, the kind of phrase that encodes information such as speaker's attitude toward the speech act, the kind of thing that you might associate with the discourse particle like a yo and ne and te, te ba or na. So the first right dislocated element moves to the left edge of the discourse B. And then the entire discourse phrase containing discourse particle will move to the left. So obviously we, we assume the discourse phrase is recursive or iterative. It's not the one-time uh, deal only. So you can actually repeat discourse phrase. So the movement to the discourse PA, the first movement that would end up being the, on the right of the entire sentence, we do not have strong evidence for or against this type of movement in Japanese, but at least we can say some movement to the left can be pretty high. Number one, scramble argument can precede topic phrase, like a, um, a phrase mark, mark with wa. So the traditional idea that a scrambling is an IP adjunction, but it certainly come before topic marking. Therefore, if you believe cartographic syntax mapping, then it's got to be higher than topic P. And the scramble argument can appear before a conditional if clause that arguably, quote unquote, modify the speech act of the consequence clause, such as, you know, discussed in the Isaac and Rollins paper. So for instance, moshi yo roshikereba, this is a kind of um, conditional that arguably um, uh, modifies speech act that follows. Scrambling can come before that. So if you think about something like speech act phrase and speak uh, a corresponding speech act, so scrambling can go pretty high. Turkish may have a, a, a better evidence. They have better evidence for the uh, uh, discourse edge movement that comes with the, uh, comes from again discourse particle ishte. As I said, ishte as a discourse marker, it can appear either at the beginning or at the end of a sentence, like a 32. If you try to insert in the middle of the sentence, it fails. However, something can come before a uh, sentence initial ishte, that's an argument. So things like a subject can come before ishte. So in other words, subject can scramble beyond ishte. And then we saw ishte at the sentence final, you can actually have, um, uh, um, uh, how do you call it, uh, right dislocation case. So we have a correspondence between the possibility of moving beyond ishte and possibility of moving come after ishte, for instance. So right dislocation is the main close phenomena. We want to say that discourse, can, discourse P cannot be embedded. So that's the one, one, one of the things we'd like to say first. It holds the information about speaker attitude of speaker's intention to connect the, the speech act or the utterance content to the discourse context or the, the uh, people's knowledge state, however you want to manipulate or the, uh, um, the, the discourse with the content of your speech act. That type of information is is located in discourse B, and therefore it's unembeddable. Okay, so yo cannot be embedded, ishte cannot be embedded, and uh, tag question cannot be embedded. Similarly, um, right dislocation cannot be embedded. So that's the idea. But of course, it's kind of a not particularly explanatory way to say, well, discourse phrase cannot embed because we have a discourse phrase. Well, why discourse phrase? Why do we have a discourse phrase involved in this particular context? And uh, to answer this question a little bit more deeply, we have to connect to the second point and third point. Second point is that it is totally optional. 
Third point is it is almost exclusively found in speech, but not in written text. So we like to kind of connect these three points and give some sort of coherent picture. So the research suggests that at the center of the right dislocation strategy lies the following conversation slash communication based director. So it's not the rule that you have to obey. It's kind of a encouragement or some sort of maxim or something like this. So communicate the essential part of the information content of the utterance as early as possible. Okay. So the idea is that predicate in case in the Japanese and Turkish, Turkish it's the, the verb plus all the morphological information that comes with the verb is the essential part of the um, uh, information. So the canonical and default linguistic unit to carry information is a sentence. Okay. And a predicate is a core ingredient of a sentence in a following sense. There are sentences without nominal arguments, such as weather predicates, that it's hot or it rains. But there are no sentences without predicates. So predicate-less utterances are often taken to be holophrastic, one word meaning a sentence, or elliptical. And the above intuition is captured by the old generative tradition that regards a sentence as a projection of the verb. And this idea was modernized by the concept of extended projection of Jane Grimshaw, in which IP and CP are extended projection of BP. So the verb is the essential part of the information that needs to be communicated early. That's important in head final language like a Japanese and uh, Turkish. If you try to obey this, um, this directive, you want to pronounce, you want to put the verb at the earlier than usual if you try to, because the usual strategy is it comes at the very end of the sentence. Okay. Of course, there is additional factor in languages like Japanese or Turkish is that it gives the information not only about the predicate information, but also tense and aspect, uh, evidentiality and, and modality and uh, close type marking, all that information somehow packed into this little uh, verbal complex or something close to the verb that is make a certain unit. Okay. So that's why it's very important to pronounce those that part of the sentence as early as possible. So in her final languages, the communication-based earliness directive leads to a non-canonical word order in which the main predicate is pronounced earlier than usual. So that's the, that's the point. Its meaning along with the order the relevant information is also revealed earlier than usual. Okay, so then second point about optionality. It means that the, R, the right dislocation is not driven by grammar. It's driven by communication-based um, uh, directive. Therefore, no feature checking, no feature to agree, no, no grammatical principle to be satisfied. Okay, so in a sense that it's not surprising that it's totally optional. Also, speech versus written text also makes sense that it, it's often found in speech. Earliest directive is, of, is meant to regulate online, meaning not offline, but online or ongoing conversation moves. So the speaker makes an online choice at the at the time of our trans that okay I should I should actually communicate the information uh, uh, essential information as early as possible so I put the verb earlier than usual uh, right dislocation is therefore almost always found in a spoken variety of language okay therefore it also makes sense that it's it targets the, the discourse phrase that contains info relevant information such as speaker attitudes or close type that is packed into the, um, uh, it's kind of inseparable, right? So in, in, in a language, a of language like ourselves, our own. So one important consequence is that gapless right dislocation, especially the repeated one, LGB on the LGB type, okay? Is expected to be something quite different from the gapped RD. Why? Because it does not follow from the earliness directive the predicate meaning is not expressed any earlier than the canonical order. So it's got to be something rather different. This conclusion may not be a universal endorse, but has some supporters, again, he's on course paper. And also we criticize the bi-closal analysis 
um, because by closed analysis don't quite fit our, 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 um, our objectives, but such an account may be suitable for the gapless uh, real, um, right dislocation. Indeed, a core, uh, uh, I think, suggests um, one type of gapless um, right dislocation comes from uh, by closer ellipsis analysis. So the general kind of scheme, the, the larger scheme of things are following. Earliness directive that we suggest with the communication-based directive works within what grammar permits. So it doesn't override grammar. So the easiest, if, if, if it could change the, the grammar, of course, what would they do? Well, I would change the headness parameter of the, the language. Uh, because once you, you change from head, head final to head initial, you have, a you have this grammar that allows you to pronounce verb earlier. You don't do that. You don't change grammar. Our proposal is that the creation of the gap uh, um, right, right dislocation structure is driven by the earliest um, dialectic, but it works within what is made available syntactically in Japanese and Turkish. So it kind of uses, okay, I'd like to pronounce verb, verb early, what kind of strategy uh, is available, strategy is available. So the movement to, on, on, of an argument to the left edge of the clause, imagine that this is an, uh, available. The remnant movement, I think this is the point that not many people, uh, many people may disagree. And imagine that these two movements are independent and available, of course, the right dislocation can make good use of them to create right dislocation structure where verb is pronounced a little earlier than usual. Okay. But we are open. We are open to suggestion. We're open to the new development and syntax. So if other means turn out to be available and useful to assist the earliness directive, such as rightward movement, the movement to the right, argument moves to the right, somehow unbound movement because embedded you know, movement has to be, out of embedded movement has to be available. We are open to the possibility that there's more than one way to get um, right dislocation structure. So in other words, hybrid approach advocated by again, He Jong Ko is definitely within um, what our current proposal can envision. Yeah, so um, the point is that if you look at the structure from a little bit not the typical question, not the typical question that the syntax, our syntax colleagues ask. We might actually see something slightly different. And I, I, I'd like to suggest that you might actually not like what you see, but I think one, one, uh, if one consider the kind of three questions that, that we had, main cross phenomena, optionality, and found in speech, and the certain answer can be drawn and I think that partly because it involves movement, many of the movement related um, properties such as coupling contraction, binding connectivity, case connectivity, the island sensitivity, and they are there. Perhaps I think we, we hope that they actually follow as well. I think that's it. Thank you for listening. I, I hope that didn't go too fast. Thank you. Thank you for your interesting talk uh, uh, comparing Korean, Japanese, and Turkish, mostly Japanese and Turkish. Mostly Japanese. Yeah. <laughs> oh, by the way, I forgot to completely forgot. I mean, many people realize that my the, the collaborator, Dusan Altinok, is present. So if you have questions about Turkish, please ask him. Hello, it's good to uh, have Dusan here. If uh, anybody has a question or comments, uh, please raise your hand or send me your name and of, or affiliation. So uh, the first uh, question comes from Sumio Nishiguchi from Otaru University of Commerce. Please unmute yourself and ask question. Okay, if, you can, you. if you can turn on your camera, that would also be nice, but it's not a must. <laughs> Oh, I, I didn't expect that. <laughs> I, I thank you very much for a nice talk. Uh, well, I have a question on the uh, intonation on like 17. Uh, is, it, is it similar with a longer, you know, how oh, should be folly, how should have the folly intonation? Uh, if it's longer, I think you present it. Yeah, so no takai kuruma, uh, you know, there's a longer phrase in 22. Is it similar, you know, like uh, they say that in English they have like a right right end, 
you know, uh, uh -huh. right, 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 right in rule. What, what was the name for that? So I wonder if it's a peculiar Japanese language uh, thing, or is it is it the same with a longer phrase? Uh, so if it's a longer phrase, is it going to be um, rising? Well, I'm not entirely sure. If I mean the 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 point is that if you have a rising intonation from the um, uh, on the right dislocated um, uh, a phrase, long or short, it feels like you are asking two questions not one question so i think what's what what is what is clear to me with 17a with this um this is what, what i consider a typical right dislocation um uh intonation with an interrogative sentence is that you are asking one question okay and if you say something like a such an expensive car did john ジョンは買いましたか。そんな高い車を。ジョンは買いましたか。そんな高い車を。うん、いや、I mm, yeah, think if you if you actually raise the um the intonation in the second, either you are asking two questions that you are re-asking with the additional phrase. Yeah, and also. Typically, when you have a, the um, uh, falling intonation, if it typically follow the the, um, uh, the usual pattern of the prosody, where the right dislocation element does not really have any kind of pitch act that the high pitch, and it's more like um, uh, low. I, I wouldn't say post vocal reduction, but much more reduced pronunciation toward the end. Yeah, so possible, but then. I think if you actually do raise a uh, second time, I think it really show that either you asking two questions or you are re-asking the question with a new addition of a, a phrase, which is probably different. Okay, all right, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, Osamu Sawada, uh, something. Please unmute yourself. And if possible, turn on your camera. Okay. Oh, thank you very much for the interesting talk, uh, Tomioka Sensei. Um, so I have a. Uh, I really liked your analysis, uh, like a um, communication based approach. Mm -hmm. And I have a question about the relationship with uh, QUD question and the discussion. Uh huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you know. Um, so you talked about the example like um, uh, John wa yonda yo LGB wo. Mm -hmm. Kind of thing. So, what yeah. will be the question and the discussion for that utterance? Yeah. Like, I was thinking that uh, you know the question will be like, did John read? Did anything or nanika yonda? John nanika yomiyashita. Then, and uh, the we can reply to that yeah. question by saying John wa yonda yo LGB yo. Then mm -hmm. I uh, I. It makes sense because uh, the important part of the information is whether John read something, right? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. It's it's yeah. It's interesting because I think mm -hmm. I think on the one hand, uh, many people thought that the right dislocation is you know that often given or recoverable. I think that's the that's the typical. Um, exp I think also. Uh, that's the one used, the term used by uh, Knut Lambrecht and the French red dislocation. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's it's hard. I mean, in a sense that, so it's a kind of difficult, uh, it's interesting and difficult um, uh, balance to strike, right? So if it's totally, totally given, what would be the most, most, most um, economical way to, to express it? It's empty pronoun because you don't have to mention it because it's already made second occurrence. Why do you have to do that? There's some, some kind of function that you actually bother to mention, right? Um, and, and I was just thinking like, when do you, so, yeah. So it's interesting that my, my scenario is like, if something is definitely there yeah. in the context, but not 
mentioned and that's that's the kind of but you want to actually co like communicate something that urgently like the predicate meaning urgently so imagine that you are that you and i go to um go to a sushi restaurant and and you get you know like a there's maguro and all that bet and i order things like um shime saba and kohada and, and aji and all that better you're a little bit surprised right I look at my choices and i see your face and i say something like that yeah, oh, yeah 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 so it's it's a kind of context like the perfectly fit so mm -hmm. i said i love them and of course nobody you didn't say i didn't say it's about the hikari mono neta right so but then then of course you can easily recover mm -hmm. then of course the idea is that it's given and we understand what i mean and i i basically said i love them that information goes first and then of course i said of course the hikari mono is is informative because we haven't really mentioned them Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of context that is suited really nicely, I think. Then, of course, what kind of question? I think it's perhaps why do you order such, you know, sushi? I think that would be what was the reason why you order. Again, that would be the kind of QUD. But I think it's it would be it would be good to find the the kind of context where perhaps right dislocated element isn't really completely completely familiar with the second occurrence so that there is a there's a reason to mention but it's really not emphasis the the location of the emphasis that would be the kind of context therefore the qud would reflect that requirement i would say mm -hmm. thank you very much thank you next question comes from tommy lee uh, of university of southern california um hi um thank you very much for the talk uh Thank so I, I have a very general question on yeah. um, the disco function function of right dislocation. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I mean, very generally, mm -hmm. uh, what is right dislocated is something that is not the focus of the sentence. And uh, but like I remember, I recall some cases discussed mm -hmm. um, in Japanese that like mm -hmm. sometimes like you can say things like uh, kare ga itta. Uh, Taroga. So so you you like kind of like you 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 it's kind of like some ways of communicating some important information where like mm -hmm. you make it short at the beginning, like you grab your mm -hmm. atten like attention. And yeah. that's why like you can have a focus at the end of yeah. the sentence. Yeah, so that's mm -hmm. the that's something that has something to do with my disclaimer one. So there are cases where um the host clause has content in it. The, the most blatant um, kind of um, uh, case would be the repetition. So that would be 6A, okay? And your case is something like 6B. And you mentioned that that book and some sort of an expression. And then perhaps I just kind of, after that saying that sentence, I thought maybe I should name that book to be a little bit more precise. And or you started saying that you know he did such and such, and then you kind of kind of name that name that uh, person or name that uh, thing, which is basically how um, the Western languages work, where the where the pronoun is basically present in the main clause. So we are sure. I mean, one one way to think about is that I don't know about the anaphora case, like a he. Okay, that's because in a sense that it makes the main clause slightly more economical so that perhaps the predicate meaning a little bit more emphasized in a sense that maybe not necessarily earliness principle, but maybe other directive, but predicate is more emphasized rather than uh, the other arguments. But in a case like um, for a where things are repeated, so the 6a, sorry, 6a, things are repeated, I would say that the function of right dislocation in, in, in a case like this would be, from the communication point of view, very different from... Um... Yeah, sorry. I mean, perhaps I should clarify my question. So yeah. like, I was thinking a sentence like, um, kare ga itta, raiden kekkon suru te. Something like that. So you, oh, 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 oh. you write this dislocate the very, very important information, which is like a big news. Yeah.
Yeah, so that's, of course, related to cytosine stock. I think it's about quotation. Yeah. Yeah, I think, like, uh, I mean, I am kind of, um, like, I mean, I'm not committed to any view because like, I'm, I, I know that there are some sayings about these type of sentences saying, I mean, they may be two sentences. I mean, you are just like creating like some, I don't know, like uh, oh, giving surprise to your ad address. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think it's, it's, it's still possible to, to give something like easily inferable content of the utterance can come there. So that's, that's perfectly possible. Whether or not it's, it can have new information. So I think the, it might be related to this Shimojo's observation that it's not the case that it's got to be given. Okay, so it was that, um, sorry. Uh, no, I think it was a Hijon's idea, right? So, yeah, so in certain cases, it's actually possible to have some kind of new information, okay? As long as, long as it's actually not contrastive and kind of a obviously generating alternatives. So, I mean, people have a different opinion of what the focus and the information relate. And one idea is that there are two types of fo uh, focus, focus or foci. One is the contrastive that has the obvious um, kind of the, the sense of uh, the, uh, alternative being generated, as opposed to kind of so-called presentational focus and focus that is considered to be new information. In this structure, uh, right, dislocation, um, really dispreferred the first kind of focus, the uh, focus, the alternative generating kind of focus. 26, like, yeah, katchate wa atashi iPad. Atashi iPad is a new information because you can actually start the conversation uh, with this sentence um, with your friend. Um, but I think there's the, 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 the there's a no clear notion of new iPad of, of, of Op, um, as opposed to what that alternative okay so if that type of kind of presentation focus or new information focus is allowed here but um uh, contrastive or alternative generating focus is not i would say in your case it would be this type of new information focus which is in principle, tolerated in right dislocation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That helps a lot. Thank you. Hmm? Yeah, thank you. Uh, let's uh, thank uh, Satoshi one more time. Uh, with thank uh, you, everybody, big, big for applause. listening, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also Drusun uh, for joining. Uh, we will now uh, stop the recording.